Hi, my name is Bonnie Martin, and I am reporting on Ellen Glasgow and her novel, and this is our life. So before we get started, we'll first take a look at a little bit of her biography to get some background. Ellen Glasgow was born in 1873 and died in 1945. She was one out of ten children from a very elite family in Virginia, and she was also the ninth out of tenth. Uh, she, unlike Willa Cather, which we've been looking at recently, would refuse to go to church with her father because she didn't believe in his uh, religious beliefs, and she also, like unlike Cather, would almost pave her way compared to what we've been reading recently, so that's kind of interesting. She is known for being very nervous and sickly, which apparently she took after her mother. Her mother contracted this nervousness because she had 10 children, allegedly, which reminds someone of the yellow wallpaper and perhaps uh, an unfortunate wrong diagnosis. But nonetheless, uh, Ellen Glasgow did actually herself have real health problems. Um, so her schooling was very informal. She was very sick. She didn't really go to school, but she did do a lot of reading and was very intellectual and ended up changing the landscape of the Southern American novel. As far as her love life, she was engaged twice, but believed that she did her best work when she was single. She was not one to combine work and pleasure. And at one point in time, she had a very secret long affair with a man in New York, which was a background for one of her other novels. Uh, some other prior context to look at before we delve into her novel is her departure from the Southern Norm. Now, the first novel I compare it to isn't a Southern novel, but it is a famous one of that time that I think she probably would have read. The Great Gatsby was published in 1925, so obviously before her novel. And what struck out, or why I kept thinking about this, was the famous line of Daisy Buchanan when she talks about her daughter. And she speaks of how her daughter should be a beautiful fool because that's the best thing a girl can be in this world. And I feel like the author, Ellen Glasgow, really departs from that, that she wants people to know that women are more than that. And I also think that it's especially interesting, not to belabor the point too much, but I, I feel like the southern United States would ascribe to that women should be beautiful and only beautiful longer than the rest of the United States, which I think most people would agree with. The other novel I would compare it to is Gone with the Wind, which was published in 1936, so um, only about five years before, and this is our life. And that is a very classic Southern novel uh, with the heroine Scarlett O'Hara, which I'm sure most, most of you know about. And Scarlet is your classic Belle, and she has her moments of independence, but very different from what I'll be looking at. And so I'll also discuss later how there are some similarities, but I think for now, I mean, even if you just picture the general connotations of Gone with the Wind, they're just completely opposite of and This Is Our Life. Continuing on, just looking at some other works of hers it's for some background. Her first novel is called The Descendant, and it highlighted on the passion of women over marriage, which obviously was very radical for her time. Her second one, Phases on an Inferior Planet, carried a similar theme, uh, more about the demise of marriage, which ended up being a common thread in her other novels, um, and you can see just a cover of that there. Overall, her novels focus on female independence, and they move past the strong patriarchal society. She had over 20 works, and she also did poems, etc. Uh, as with her old novels, she really liked realism, and she liked being ironic, and we will see that coming up once again. Now, to give you some context of the time period in which This Is Our Life was published, it was during World War II, and specifically it's the same year that we had that attack on Pearl Harbor just to put things in perspective. A good way to look at the reader of In This Is Liar Life is to somewhat visualize Rosie the Riveter which you know this poster shown here by J. Howard Miller it really was about female empowerment which is reflected by Ellen Glasgow and it also discusses a lot about like the second shift 
and just some feminist issues. And continuing on, I think another thing to think about is the feminism and the feminist perspective brought here. Uh, this novel personally, was, or excuse me, specifically, was between official waves of feminism. The first wave ends with women's suffrage in the late 20s. And the second one, which is, you know, more, the more radical burn your bra wave, really wasn't in full swing until the 60s. So she was kind of a proto-second wave feminist, which once again made... And this is our life and her other novels radical for being a southern novel maybe not radical completely as a whole but very important nonetheless um all right continuing we'll get into the actual novel and this is our life so it was published in 1941 and took the pulitzer prize in 1942. it was also later made into a movie which i will touch on pretty soon she took a very modern approach for her time period, as I already aforementioned, and here's a little description of that. In the article, that abused word modern in Ellen Glasgow's Literature of the Revolt, Catherine Rainwater writes, quote, In the novel of the South and elsewhere, Glasgow aligns herself with the modernist. To those of us who are and always have been in accord with the artistic impulse we are pleased to call modernism, it is a relief to find that the horizon of even the American novel is fluid, not fixed, and that there is a way of escape from the artificial limitations of material and method." Unquote. And so that's kind of a good way to frame what I'm going to be going into. And This Is Our Life follows the characters of two sisters named Stanley and Roy. So yes, you heard that right there, two girls named after essentially two boys. The setting is in Virginia where Glasgow grew up. Roy is the more responsible sister who is portrayed as being loving and a lot like her father, and Stanley conversely acts on whims and considers no one but herself. This passage at the beginning of the novel describes their father, Asa's, trepidation with his children, which is quote one. She writes, He had learned long ago that the only sure way to win and keep their respect was to conceal from them how easily his thin defense could be pierced. That was why he had clothed himself in this protective coloring of ironic amusement. Um, beyond just being a very uh, nice quotation from the novel, I think, it shows the irony explicitly with the term ironic amusement and just shows that these girls are so independent that their father even has defenses against him, which I think is rather interesting. Moving on to explain it in brevity, the novel focuses much on love, the lack there of love, and the stealing of love. Stanley steals the husband, Peter Kingsmail, of her sister Roy, right before Stanley was intended to marry Craig Fleming. Stanley and Peter then run off to Baltimore. Over time, back at home, Roy, the stable sister, finds companionship in Stanley's ex flame Craig. Essentially, the two swap loves, but in a crooked way due to Stanley's selfishness. Although it is much more of a kernel than a satellite to the story, it should be mentioned that Stanley's uncle, William Fitzroy, dotes on her in a very unhealthy way. Quote, to I have shown, highlights the father's conundrum with love. This is where he considers Roy's new affections for Craig, and I think it speaks largely to a question Ellen Glasgow has produced writ large. He thinks, uh, as long as she loves someone, as long as she is free to give herself, she will be safe. Are all women like that? Is loving more necessary to women than being loved? And I think in another light that Ellen Glasgow could really disagree with this. I think maybe she's showing that men don't understand women. I feel like she doesn't believe, as an author, from what I've read, that women need to love someone rather than be loved. I think she wants to show them independent, and which, I mean, I think the plot line illustrates. Uh, as one might expect, Stanley and Peter do not experience marital bliss. Stanley overspends their wealth, and Peter eventually commits suicide. This may resonate to us with the similar story of Carrie and Hurstwood and Dreiser's sister Carrie that we have recently read. Stanley goes back to Virginia, going back home, which I kind of connected with a theme in House of Seven Gables. Anyway, she goes back uh, in the wake of the death and continues her destructive, destructive behavior. First, she attempts to steal Craig back again from her sister Roy, and then she drunkenly kills a young child in a car accident. If the spiral of hers wasn't complete, she ultimately blames the death of the child on the son of her family servant. His name is Perry Clay. Such a clumsy device is known, and Stanley dies of a similar fate, 
trying to uh, get away from trouble in an accident by a car, which um, in literary terms is definitely poetic justice. A third quote I pulled from the text somewhat seems to be the epitome of Stanley's character throughout the novel and explains much of her actions in the major plot points. She says, I, Stanley, cannot bear to see other people happy when I am so, so miserable. And I just think this really illustrates how selfish she is and you can get a pretty good picture of what she would be like. So, moving on, um, it was made into a movie in 1942, the year after it was published, that starred Betty Davis, Hattie McDaniel, and Olivia de Havilland. Apparently, the author, Glasgow, wasn't very happy with the movie, and it got mediocre reviews. But there are still some interesting facts about it. For instance, Hattie McDaniel and Olivia were both key characters in the actual movie of Gone with the Wind. Hattie uh, is the servant of Scarlett O'Hara, and Olivia is cousin Melly, the very nice loving cousin that no one can find fault with, which is really opposite of In This Is Our Life. So while I brought up Gone With The Wind before, I bring it up again and, you know, challenge, challenge the notion of thinking Stanley would be a good archetype to compare to Scarlett O'Hara. Although Ellen Glasgow does depart from the classic Southern novel, both Scarlett and Stanley are extremely selfish. They both jump from man to man and additionally, Scarlet is definitely one to make others unhappy when she is unhappy. If you've seen the movie or read the book, which is just like that last quote from Stanley where she is shown to be incredibly selfish. Another relevant thing to consider, I think, is the naming scheme. Um, as I've been talking about, the two sisters are named after men, Stanley and Roy, which is definitely a feminist move, I would argue. Uh, would the characters behave differently if they are females? Also to note, I mean, as far as motivation from the parents, both of their names, Asa and Lavinia, are rather ambiguous gender-wise as well. Are the sisters supposed to take on male characteristics? Do they? Um, I would say that they do take on male characteristics in a sense. Roy, you know, is the family man who's at home, works things out, and Stanley's perhaps the man that women envy, the one who allegedly can be emotionless and jump from person to person and has a lot of independence. So I think the names do have somewhat of an impact. And finally, and very importantly, the American dream. I feel like this novel asks the question, can money buy happiness? Um, and it's not just gendered or societal, but there is an element of intersectionality. It's not, you know, the American dream from a female's perspective or just from a rich person's perspective. There's also a race involved. For example, Perry Clay is moving towards his American dream. He's working for a law, firm, a law firm and has attendance in law school, but he's also framed temporarily, which just really speaks of race and the American dream, as he is an African American from the servant of the household of the family of Roy and Stanley. And finally, a thing to consider is marriage within the American dream, which is a part of the scheme generally. Is it not intended to be a part of the dream, does Ellen, believe, Ellen Glasgow believe? And how, what's the role beauty plays into it? It reminds one of Sister Carrie as well. Although these conclusions are not set in stone, I do think Glasgow does show independence in women as being good and empowering, as well as being destructive and potentially manipulative. But she does explicitly show one can perish on the road, literally, to the American dream, with Stanley being the perfect, perfect case in point. And finally, there's this last quotation that I think really sums it all up. From the article, Heroism and Tragedy, The Rise of the Redneck in Glasgow's Fiction by Dwayne Carr, he writes, Nonetheless, one must give credit to Glasgow for seeking to discover basic truths for herself, to work out the conflict she felt between what she knew of her heritage and what might be a just and humane way of looking at society. To do this, she had to ask questions about the assumed inherent or inherited qualities of the individual, which justified the old system, and environmentally induced qualities, which justified democracy. So it talks about kind of the nature versus nurture in a person, which is really what is shown in the characters of the sisters, since they are opposites, um, and just from the feminine perspective. Um, so although she does show moving from the past, she also shows going into the future. And here is a look at my work cited, and there's back to the beginning, and thank you for watching.